right, so doing a deep dive today on some projects for you guys. And of course, Chainlink is one of the ones who's been making some recent moves here that may be of greater importance, especially in the banking system. So we'll break all this down for you guys today. You don't want to miss this one. My name is Paul Barrow. Welcome back into Tech, Tech Path. Let's get into it today, and I want to jump into it. Before we get started, if you have not checked out our website, just go to pbn3.com. Now, there's a couple of things you can do over there. You can get into something we call the Crypto Power Index. You can join that. We also have a program that includes the Crypto Power Index, which is our mastermind. It's actually a private group that is hosted by me over on Slack. We do a lot of communication, get early access to the CPI drops and additional trading things, and my own input and research on what we're doing internally. So if you guys want to check it out, make sure we'll leave a link down below uh, in the description. All right, so let's get into a couple of things. First, I want to do is get into what is Chainlink. I want to go to a clip that gives a better explanation than maybe I could. Listen in. The Chainlink network offers a solution to the age-old problem. Garbage in, garbage out, which means that an application can only produce high-quality results with high-quality data. How does data get onto the Chainlink network? The answer is node operators. I want to be a trusted source of data? Ask me any question. Now you might be wondering, why do they have to lock up their money? Well, if we can prove that they are no longer being truthful, we can actually take that money from them. This incentivizes them to always tell the truth. However, the next question you might have is why would they take this risk in the first place? Here's a hint, it's to earn money. People pay these node operators to give them reliable and truthful outside real-world data. It's a win-win situation. With Chainlink, a smart contract can access data pertaining to financial markets, cryptocurrency prices, weather, sports results, IoT sensor readings, and any other real-world validated data needed to enable more robust and useful blockchain-based applications. All right, so there's a lot here because with Chainlink, what it really boils down to is proof of reserves. And this will go into a lot of things within the banking ecosystem. You'll start to see a little bit of this puzzle put together as we go into the video here. I want to play the second clip on proof of reserves. Listen in. We work on creating infrastructure that is tamper-proof and conflict of interest free. Proof of reserves, as an example, was not so important or critical or, or valuable before FTX, right? After FTX, proof of reserves became an obvious solution for eliminating the conflict of interest that allows someone to manipulate a balance sheet to basically take your money. And even if they didn't take your money, they screwed all of us because now we have to explain to everybody why we are not FTX or Alameda. We have to justify this for months and years to gain back the trust of institutions and users to grow our industry. There is actually a whole other category of things such as computation and cross-chain communications that can control these protocols as well. And if, if we continue to do this, we will have a nice architecture like this. And this nice architecture will be the future of the entire global financial system. All right, so as you can see, really on proof of reserves, it gets into a much deeper narrative around not only what FTX did, but I think what this could play into is the banking system. Now, this could be good and bad. I'll explain that in a little bit. But I want to look at their uh, case studies because this is kind of interesting in terms of the total value that they've secured so far, $20 billion, which they claim is really just a drop in the bucket. And you can see some of the partners here, obviously, with uh, Flexa. You've got Synthetics in here, Compound, et cetera. So it is definitely a solution that starts to really create a new financial framework. And a lot of this plays out in international cash settlements, et cetera. We'll play into that here in a second. I want to go to clip three, which is the banking sector. Listen to what they had to say. We're generating an interface for capital markets and banks to properly interact with um, blockchains very efficiently. And we've seen more and more of them uh, start to talk with us about building more advanced applications. We are working with um, an increasingly larger amount of banks. And some of the things I'm seeing there suggest to me that things will move beyond a proof of concept into a pilot and into production. I don't think we're going to be getting rid of the old uh, messaging systems or the old backends or even the Cobalt servers or any of this stuff. People have been trying to get rid of that for decades. They still don't have a way to get, get rid of it. And the, the only real option is to get those systems that you defined, ISO 20022 standard or others, yeah. 
to interface efficiently with multiple chains. And in that efficient interfacing, you will eliminate the friction that banks and institutions have for interacting with chains. Right. And by eliminating that friction, you'll get that, you get more of that 471 trillion into the system. And then the, that rising tide floats all these boats. All right, so I, I agree with him to a certain extent. First of all, cobalt, this is essentially what I cut my teeth on when I was going into computer science back in the 90s. Uh, it is real, and there is a big transition process between the current banking system. I'm intrigued by what he's talking about of interfacing with the on-chain data with the systems that are legacy like that. And if they have truly come up with a solution, that's a big deal. I want to get into a couple of things here on this Bank of America global research paper that was done. This is the global digital assets beyond crypto tokenization uh, research. And there was a lot that really went into this, a lot of details. They were talking about traditional assets tokenization reaching 16 trillion transforming infrastructure markets over the next five to 15 years. That's pretty significant. Uh, tokenization enables efficiencies, cheaper, simpler, et cetera. And also generation of SaaS, which will play into, I think, a lot of other services, plus DLT and BCT is more than just crypto trading. Institutional and corporate use cases are going to be in, in production here. Now, what this simply means is that there is a framework here where banking will start to utilize these tool sets. The interesting thing in this report, Chainlink is mentioned seven times. So it's clear that Bank of America understands where Chainlink is going with this technology transfer. And remember what I've often said is that the companies that are able to merge the web two, which is the legacy systems that drive all things on both the internet, but also the sub layer, uh, all the way into the dark web is going to be the winner. And I think Chainlink is one of those companies that starts to do that. Uh, very interesting. Let's get into the Swift explanation. And if you under, understand how Swift works, we'll explain it here in a second, but listen in. I'm very happy to announce that we are working on an initial proof of concept together with Swift on the use of CCIP. So Swift is a cooperative, is an international cooperative. Uh, we run perhaps the biggest network in financial services today for capital markets, for payments, for FX, for trade. It's, it's the end of a long story, right? I think five or seven years ago was the first time uh, Swift and Chainlink started working together. Uh, you were actually one of the first uh, startups that we uh, bet on. You won the startup challenge that we used to have a long time ago. At the time, nobody was doing anything on blockchain, on financial services. Swift and Chainlink worked together on the first POC that we did on bond issuance and redemption. It was quite successful. And that, that was maybe the, uh, the first steps of this sort of love story between Swift and Chainlink, yeah, which continues today. All right, so this is a good thing because mainly Swift is the messaging system right now that moves money across nations, and it works for nation states, big banks, etc. Sergey goes in on this on a tweet here, just likely as the key standards for such as TCP/IP uh, remade fragmented early internet into a single global internet. And if you guys understand how the internet works, you know TCP/IP was essentially the architecture that helped create the World Wide Web when Tim Berners-Lee started to move into what we know today as the graphical interface. And this is kind of what they're talking about here. Let me expand this out and I'll zoom out a little bit, but you'll see here, this is the transition te technology that Chainlink is talking about. This is where the current bank chain value lies versus what the public chain value lies. And essentially what this means is it will start to enable a lot of these cross-border payments and a lot of these big transactions, which could go into other layers of technology. And I'll explain what that means here in a minute. One other note here is remember that Swift has a somewhat heavy competitor in Ripple. And that would be the only layer into this. But the fact that we could have two different competing technologies rising here is a good thing, I think, for the industry. It's good for blockchain. And I think it's good for the banking system, which eventually it's just a matter of time before we see a lot of adoption. Uh, so I wanna go to clip five, which is them explaining this new CCIP, which is really the major update uh, for Chainlink. And it's the one that I think has caused a little bit of this price movement, listen in. All the different features of all the different blockchains and all of their different capabilities really need to be something that we give people access to. 
Because giving people and, and developers the ability to generate a smart contract on Ethereum, use DeFi protocols on other chains, or, or, or do whatever complicated combination they want to do is something that will unlock an entire world of innovation. It will unlock an entire um, new set of applications that were previously not available. Cross-chain interoperability protocol, or CCIP, just launched on mainnet early access. When it comes to sending arbitrary data, this could be anything from the details of an NFT, function calls, status updates, or anything you can dream up. Last, both can be combined in a single CCIP transaction. You could transfer tokens along with instructions telling the receiving contract what to do with them on the destination chain. I don't know about you, but this is pretty exciting news. So this really opens up a lot of opportunity here. This is one of the big limitations of all these different chains is not the capability of cross-chain compatibility, but those messaging systems that lie in there to be able to transfer that data. This is a very big thing. I think this is one of the reasons, obviously, they're showcasing it. Over on their website, cross-chain, by Chainlink, now you can sign up for mainnet early access. So for a lot of the developers that are out there, and starting to do that, you'll notice some of the ones you recognize there with Ethereum, Optimism, Avalanche, et cetera, Polygon. But the point is, is that this starts to open up and get into an area that I often have said is one of the challenges for blockchain. And that is this wall that Chainlink it essentially has just blocked and knocked down. So this is a big deal for what they've been able to do. All right, so before we get into this next section, I wanna just, just touch on gaming quickly. So they've got a section, obviously, there on the website, uh, Powering Web3 Gaming. You can see some of the partners there, Luvium, Gala, Axie, Avagachi, etc. But the point is, is that they've got some really interesting ways to be able to integrate to these. So that in itself is also another leap forward because it crosses into different industries, etc. And gaming, of course, I think is going to be a big one. And you've, you've heard it before. We dedicate a show to it with Metaverse Insider as we think Web3 and gaming and these kinds of technology advancements are going to be very critical. All right, so I'm going to play this next clip, which is talking about dynamic NFTs and why they're so important. Listen in. So we're going to make an NFT where the image and attributes change over time. Our NFT is now on OpenSea. Perfect, here it is. If we look here, hey, we performed upkeep. Perfect. Our keeper has grown the flower. So we requested that change. Hey, look at that. Our NFT has changed. That's awesome. Let's take a look and see if it's been 30 seconds yet. Okay. We're going to need to upkeep again. Let's cross our fingers and boom, there it is. All right. So as you can see, great use case, especially in in-game assets, things of that nature, but also there could be some real world use cases outside of gaming that play into this. Uh, dynamic NFTs, interesting. Uh, but I also want to get into some real world use cases. So listen into this clip right here. This also gives you the ability to have your NFT. And as you progress through the game, as you grow in levels, as you equip different equipment, hidden traits can be unlocked. Well, imagine that you're running an augmented reality application. You take your phone, you're going in the real world and you see, I don't know, something like a augmented reality creature and you catch it, you capture it somehow. An NFT will be minted because you're causing, right? You're causing an unlocking of an achievement by going to a new place or capturing a creature, which actually creates this effect where something can come up. Mr. Beast could use DNFTs in conjunction with one of his businesses that other shop owners could actually buy ingredients and make burgers with a nice enough margin to incentivize them to do it. And he could market these to help in COVID relief to small business restaurants that weren't getting a lot of orders for their current products. Now imagine if Mr. B said, hey, I'm gonna drop an NFT where you basically have 10,000 NFTs. And every time one of my videos breaks a record, you're gonna be given five free Mr. Beast burger, burger credits. This would make a lot of sense for Mr. Beast because if you think about it, this would actually get people to order the burgers in his community. Okay, this is a perfect example of how a dynamic NFT could take the data from YouTube videos that he posts and literally change the benefits that the NFT holder receives. 
All right, if you guys understand that, that's, that's really a huge uh, functional capability of taking an NFT because they've been static in the past. Now, if you've got new data inputs that could change that NFT and its value, maybe even its use case, this changes everything in the loyalty scheme that a lot of retailers utilize of how to put together loyalty pro products and services for customers who are coming into their restaurants or fashion brands, you name it. it doesn't, retail is going to be completely revamped with what this might go. This is a good example of just showing how, you know, with, with Jimmy, with Mr. Beast, of doing something for Beast Burger, of how that applies to something else, which is a data input from YouTube, this could be a variety of things. So it really starts to create an opportunity for a lot of creativity for brands to get involved in this. Now, the question is, is, is it ready to go mainstream just yet? That'll be the real challenge that I think a lot of these blockchains, being able to go at small scale is really kind of the bigger challenge that I, really everybody faces today. I wanna to get into uh, one other aspect of this, and that is, uh, kind of the last component here, and a lot of people always ask me, especially around blockchain, you know, is it bad for the climate? All those kind of things. Chainlink does check that box. If you go to their industry or to their website, the industry standard for on-chain climate data, they've built this into it. Some people may look at this and say, Paul, we don't really care about ESG, but the point is, is that some companies that are going to say we want to deploy with this, the fact that Chainlink has been able to get into you know climate neutral uh, capacity. This is going to be a pretty uh, a pretty good thing because it will check the box. It will possibly make the reason and the use case for a brand or even banks or other entities could be nation states that says, "Hey, we want that to be a part of it in how we select it in the future." So that's the good thing about that. All right. So another thing with uh, circulating supply about half a billion. So that's one good advantage. They're going to link one or excuse me, uh, capped at one billion total on the uh, supply for Chainlink, so that's a good thing. Again, also, if you like tokenomics and you're following that on some of these projects, this one fits the bill there as well. So when you look back, just to recap, a lot of new innov innovations, a lot of new partnerships, some potentials in both Web3, banking, and retail. All of this is starting to look like Chainlink could be one of the major players, especially as they continue this advancement. Only one thing, and that is, can they scale? Will this be able to truly scale at speed and be able to handle what could come at them from the Web3 gaming sector, from the retail sector, and obviously from the banking sector. All that yet to be determined, but it is one that we are watching very closely. If you guys are listening in over on the Diamond Circle, or excuse me, over on the podcast, maybe on Spotify or maybe on Apple, make sure, if anything, give us a, a, a rating over there. We love those. But the best thing is jump over here to the YouTube channel. You get a little bit more detail when we break down projects like this one. And it's also a great place where you can join into our Diamond Circle. And that's where you can get additional content, including our own Diamond Circle podcast, which is only available in the Diamond Circle. So join that. Click the link down below. You can get started on that. If you guys want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.